Dollar Will, I'm coming to you with another video. You know, we, we, we try and get these technical difficulties abrupt and, um, you know, trying to fix, trying to fix these, um, <sighs> connection problems. You know, I just can't wait to really begin this interview. This interview, I, I've been waiting for this for weeks. And we, you know, going to teach y'all something. And I can't wait, man, because uh, out of all the days, I want to have, you know, technical problems. Hey, John, I'm trying to get you in here, man. Yeah, we, we're really trying to... Let me see. Okay, this is how we're going to do this since, since this is not working out. I'm going to just do it like that. See if a video chat him off my laptop. Go turn this around. Okay, John, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, we finally get... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little delayed, but that's okay. Okay, well, I already read your your um bio. Okay, well, unless you want me to do it again. Bio. Okay, unless you want me to do it again. It's up to you. you yeah, I don't care. Okay, we well, started, man. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to the show. And how about you give us your background a little bit? Uh, sure. Well, I've been, you know, as you said earlier, I've been uh, doing counseling for over 30 years, specializing in trauma and addictions. And uh, I started working on this topic in 1989 when I was working as a, uh, doing addictions counseling in Baltimore City. And uh, someone told me their father was a Black Panther killed by the police. And uh, I was learning a lot about uh, the uh, underworld with from my clients, but also doing research on the side about it all. And I uh, wrote maybe a short story about it in, in Baltimore and read it in Baltimore, and people liked it and uh, were buying copies of that short story at a local, you know, some local bookstores. And so um, that was like made into a chap book at that time. Uh, I don't know if you remember those things or you, you have heard of those things. But then, and one of the characters was, a, you know, as I say, was based on the client I was counseling. But um, so I researched the Black Panthers when I was, and when I was researching the New York Black Panthers, I found that the Shakurs, of course, were the leading New York Black Panthers. And I saw the situation happen with Tupac City. And uh, at that time, I moved to Washington. I was, uh, this was about, you know, up to 1994, November 94 so. I moved to Washington, and in Washington, D.C., in the Washington Post, they said another strange twist. The same police officers that came upon uh, Tupac when he was shot in the New York recording studio lobby uh, were the first to come in another part of the way out of their district uh, for the sexual assault situation. And so it listed other strange twists in, you know, police kind of foul play. And so I called... A cold called Tupac's New York trial lawyer, Michael Tariq Warren, and said, um, do you think they're trying to kill Tupac like they were trying to kill his Black Panther parents in another you know, FBI counterintelligence program? And he said, yes, and nobody's writing about it. And I was like, well, I wanted to write an article about that subject for um, the you know activist magazines around the country, which he also read. Z Magazine, Covert Action Quarterly, which was started by a CIA whistleblower, things like that, The Nation. And so he gave me an hour or two interview, and I uh, wrote an article. But the, the, the activist magazines at that time were dominated by whites who didn't, weren't all understanding that Tupac could be um, only pretending to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them. 
and that's what I later found out. But I, I knew he, he was, you know, had an activist, and that the police were likely trying to kill him for that activism. But I didn't get the full picture until about a year or two later when I um, interviewed his uh, business manager and longtime political mentor, Watani Tayahimba, um, who was a former Black Panther. And Watani, I, I asked Watani, you know, was he only pretending to be this gangster in order to appeal the gang? Uh, so that's not, so people, it's sad that people didn't really find out who he really was. Uh, because of that act of his, but he was a, a political prodigy. I mean, he was an intellectual prodigy. He was a, a political leader before he became a rapper. He was head of the New African Panthers, which was active in eight to ten cities around the country. And so, yes, the FBI has that, that activism and that that potential to influence you know, many millions around the world. And he had the kind of potential that Fred Hampton had, in the sense that he was universally a uh, loved by all races, and it had the potential to unite you know, class war against the oligarch, you know, the uh, powers that be, um, to stop them from doing all they're doing to the 99% of us, which is, you know, um, really uh, genocidal, I think, these days, especially with um, everything going on. But they, they've been that way for a long time with getting the drugs in you know, communities of color, and um, just hurting us all in different ways with uh, their different programs. Um, I wanted to ask you, so when people, you know, basically talk about, you know, Tupac being just a rapper, being a, a gangster, or, or he was just a, a menace, but a lot of people doesn't understand how many life and death situations that he's been in. So can you... Sure. So... Uh one thing people have to understand is that um, Afeni Shakur, Afeni Shakur was his mother, was a one-time leader of the New York Black Panthers, was elected to Harlem, you know, had the Harlem Black Panthers while her uh, husband, uh, Lumumba, was in jail, and she was let out on bail at Panther 21. Um, she uh, revolution, she said. And when I talk about revolution, I don't mean like uh, a war with guns necessarily. I mean just you know, using guns for self-defense while you try to change things change all society for the better, for the masses, for the 99% of us. And so, you, you know, when a preacher in, in uh, you know, Harlem, Reverend Daltrey, asked him what he wanted to be when he was his lifelong mission was to be this, you know, activist changing things for the better. And um, so he never gave that up. And so when he started to add wealth and fame with that first, you know, uh, solo record release, to Apocalypse Now, and that got a world, his first video got that worldwide MTV release, Trapped. You know, right a few days after its release, police stopped him supposedly for jaywalking in Oakland, beat his head, uh, choked him unconscious and beat his head into the curb. And I show evidence of uh, people dying in police hands from those, you know, act, those behaviors. Um, then there was a uh, shooting on, on his limb from the uh, premiere of Juice, um, to the after party. And then there was um, the, city, the situation with the Marin Fest. Now, the best evidence on that situation was that strangers tried to punch him first and then shot at him for no reason. And his, um, you know, his, his uh, close his, um, merely took out a gun and shot up at the sky, according to eyewitnesses, in, in self defense to scare the, the attackers away. And they kept attacking. And the best evidence is that the FBI's um, agent held the supervisor for the San Francisco Bay Area uh, orchestrated that incident because all the evidence with mob influence and things like that, that he got uh, the mob of people at Marin to try to kill Tupac in that situation, including a guy who said on film that he was, a, he was friends with Tupac before that, but he, he was kind of influenced by these techniques, these psychological techniques, to go after Tupac and his, his group. And so um, this was 1990, I believe it was 92, at that point in the piece, um, you know, there was this undercover agent named Jacques Agnon. Um, he's known in different interviews by his, his uh, you know, false names, his pseudonyms, aliases, like Nigel and, and other things in interviews. But, you know, everyone knows uh, Haitian Jack knew he was working for the feds in that song. Um, that was Jacques Agnon. He mm -hmm. was uh, the Lauren I mentioned earlier got uh, someone on the inside to get his rap sheet and he had a he said he had a long list 
of major offenses, major charges, um, and he was, you know, he basically let off on all of them. Okay, he said that's a short line of an undercover agent, um, someone working, and this was in cities up and down the East Coast, so it was obviously a federal issue that he was working for the feds and not just uh, police. So that's the, you know, just some of the evidence that this guy Jacques Nunn set up the sexual assault situation. Um, that was basically, you know, according to court documents I got, because I got the court documents on the case from the lawyers, that it was um, touching. He got only found guilty. He got, the, you know, sexual um, assault, attempted, you know, attempted sodomy, uh, forced sodomy, um, things like that. Um, all these things. He was only found guilty for touching a woman's butt against her will. After. And they both said in court testimony that there was consensual sex. Okay, um, so after a few nights before, they you know, he had he said, I, "I love the way you f u c k," and I want to you know do it some more. Had that on tape, and they, the police said they accidentally erased the tape. Okay, so uh, they erased evidence, they tampered with evidence, and so that's just some of that of what was going on. So then he he ends up getting shot by um, shot at by supposedly off-duty police officers in Atlanta. Now, according to the eyewitnesses, uh, I talked to Tupac's cousin who saw it live. I talked to Watayin Tayhimbo who saw it live. So I, talk, I, I got um, the you know, newspaper records from Atlanta where it happened. And the best evidence is that a group, you know, uh, some white, white witnesses that it looked like a mob of whites, a group of whites, ran over Tupac's car and the evidence is that they actually first uh, broke the window, Tupac's window, with the butt of their gun, um, shot at him. Tupac nearly rolled out the back of his car, grabbed the security guard's gun, and shot back in self-defense. And um, he hit the white police officers, you know, who were off duty at times. So they weren't in police clothes. And they didn't say uh, police, which could have saved them. Um, when, a, when Tupac shot back, he shot, you know, he was shooting cops. He thought he was just shot, shooting random people who were trying to kill him. And he shot them in the butt and the leg as they were, you know, pointing their gun back whilst they're running away because they saw that huge, huge group come out of their cars. Um, so, um, police, uh, so Tupac is completely let off of that situation. Now, how many times can you go into the deep south and shoot you know, and be a uh, black man and be let off? So why did they completely let him off? Because they didn't want the evidence to come out that this was an attempted murder by the police. It was too obvious. They had stolen a gun from an evidence locker. It was a th what, what police call a throwaway gun. I have the uh, police testimony from another trial that they call that a throwaway gun. So that when you do a le an illegal murder, you can just you know lay it aside. It's unmarked. It's um, you know, clearly another um, attempt to murder Tupac. Then you got the situation with the Quad Studio, okay, Quad Recording Studio, um, the November 30th, of 1994. And that was right before the jury was supposed to come out with a verdict on the box trial situation, which was a big setup and poorly for uh, the, the prosecution. And so with that um, situation in the Quad Studios, one bullet put Tupac on the ground, and then there was two bullets put in his skull, according to a doctor's affidavit, which was uh, she signed an affidavit to exactly what she, exa you know, how she examined Tupac and what she found. It's a Queen Court Records. I have that copy of that. I have it in the book. You can see a copy of it in the book. Uh, she put out the front of Tupac's skull while he was lying face down on the ground. And uh, they barely missed his brain. Those two bullets barely missed his brain. Now, that, that's the modus operandi of uh, police, you know, military assassinations. You put one bullet to get him on the ground, and you put two bullets in their head. Um, they did that to Huey Newton, that exact. And so, and what's interesting is the fact that when they tried to kill Tupac uh, at the 1992 Marin Fest, it was an exact three-year anniversary of when they assassinated Huey Newton, who Tupac loved, and Tupac was consulting with when he was part of the New African Panthers. You know, um, so here we have another, you know, yet another police assassination attempt, and of course, and then finally it's where you have. Uh, you know, undercover police and FBI agents all around the situation. Um, you know, Kevin Hack, he said he was working for the FBI at that time. He was one of Tupac's top two bodyguards. Um, Frank Alexander was police. Um, Reggie Wright even admitted um, working with the feds in a recent interview um, in terms of he just said he's only been a police officer, but I argue that he was still undercover police. 
when he had um, the police, you know, all the security guard uh, around Tupac not have guns. He gave them uh, cell phones without batteries that didn't work. And so he completely set up a situation for Tupac's execution. And why did he do that? And, you know, U.S. intelligence. And what was his father? His father was head of the gang unit in Compton. And why is that important? Because Tupac's um, agenda, his thug life agenda, and his what I said before was his agenda of pretending to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them was part of the gang peace truce movement. His own family had helped, helped start in Los Angeles and then spread throughout California and then spread throughout the country. And that was a huge threat to the powers that be because it started getting loads of gangs to, to start doing more honest work. And, I mean, it spread to New York City so that the young lord, you know, I mean, the um, Latin Kings, the largest gang in New York City, um, stopped dealing drugs completely. That's been documented by uh, New York professors in a book about that, their transformation to activism based on Tupac's thug life movement, you know, and uh, the, basically the gang peace truce movement that the Panthers and Tupac were involved in. And so, about that in the book and all, and, and you know, the FBI wanted to watch one black leaders, and also drugs as weapons against us. Now, drugs as weapons against us just adds the element of why the CIA got involved. Because when you get into drug trafficking, drug dealing, and drug trafficking, you, that's CIA territory. They're the biggest drug traffickers in the world. I mean, that's been documented that they were drug trafficked, in, you know, in the Washington Post, uh, that, that they were, you know, CIA was drug trafficking, you know, especially around the Iran Contra. Uh, situation with the um, you know crack cocaine scandal down you know with the uh, Contras in, in Nicaragua. So when Tupac was threatening to affect billions of dollars of profits in drug trafficking and tens to hundreds of dollars when you have all that cash going through the banks and they're money laundering it, it adds to the uh, corporate profit in, in by 20 or 30 fold and to, by stock market value. And that's where the huge money is that he, he was affecting with his gang peace juice movement that he was helping engender around the country. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just unfortunate because, you know, we have been indoctrinated into thinking that we come from the, the greatest country in the world, but really we don't, you know, and, and it's, and, and it's just like with the war on drugs, and, and mainly to really, um, you know, to, to to get our fathers and our grandparents and this and that into prison. And and that really broke up a lot of families. And I want to know if that was like pretty much a, like a government, a, a, like a COINTELPRO situation, something else. You mean uh, trying to get people in prison and all? Yeah. Try, trying to get a lot of black uh, families and you know, fathers and people in prison. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, yeah, partly the counterintelligence program and partly the CIA's um, different programs. Uh, MK Ultra being one of them. I talk more about the CIA war on musicians and activists, which is with a book and a film, you know, um, uh, talks about MK Ultra, and that's what I think they MK Ultra's main um, main focus was was a war on people of color in this country uh, with the use of drugs. Now they used they did drug trafficking um, with heroin continued till now, of course, but um, uh, then they added you know, cocaine to it. Now, not that they weren't, they were always trafficking cocaine and heroin, but they massively increased it with the, uh, with the war in Vietnam, for the, you know, in the Golden Triangle area for uh, poppy fields that produces opium and heroin. And then when they lost that Vietnam War, um, the amount of heroin started to go down again, so they started a new Golden Crescent for poppy fields, which is the other end of the same mountain range, the Himalayan mountain range in the Afghanistan area. And that started in 1979. And the CIA was trafficking heroin out of there. And that kept increasing uh, until we got get to the Afghanistan war, of course, which, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that the two longest wars in U.S. history are Vietnam and Afghanistan. Areas in the world for producing heroin. And 
and so they're pumping that into communities of color in a big way and all, we're all getting affected all communities are getting affected because the, you know the 99 they're targeting the 99 percent in general and that's the way the oligarchs are but they're particularly racist and particularly targeting you know communities of color and so uh, so I, that mk ultra is a huge program that's um all best evidence is still going on it's it's overlaps the counterintelligence program which um says it officially disbanded in 1971 when activists broke into an fbi office and found all these documents and revealed them but uh former co-intelligence pro aging in the 1990s i think his memoir came out about 1995 he says he, he knows that these programs are still going on today with just using different names and so um these are all programs, yes, they're targeting the 99% of us, but particularly brutally targeting people of color and communities of color. And sure, they want to just get uh, people involved in the drug world, imprisoned, uh, imprisoned for things that aren't involved in drugs or anything, you know, when, when, you know uh, things that they shouldn't be jailed for. But that's what they do. It's a psychological warfare, as, along with actual warfare against communities of color. Okay, well... Well, back in March, beginning of the pandemic, matter movement was infiltrated by FBI informants as well. I don't know for sure, but I saw. I mean, I saw evidence, uh, you know, video evidence of uh, people that caused uh, loads of, you know, like conducted vandalism in a huge way, and then were filmed getting back into cars that. Uh, so I do think they were probably infiltrated in a big way and um, made to look bad, but also um, they did things. Um, you know, some people think that they, they helped destroy some of the communities they were marching in because um, they wanted to destroy small businesses. And, you know, Black Lives Matter didn't want to destroy traders that were doing this vandalism that were destroying, um, you know, these communities. Now, when I, I marched with Black Lives Matter in Baltimore, I didn't see any of this, this vandalism. But of course, they're you know they're going to stay away from the uh, the kind of uh, crowds that you know that might point them out and show them for what they are. They're going to try to like get the big numbers in other crowds and pretend like it's um, you know, they have devious methods and devious ways. And yes, they're you know they're doing some ugly stuff and they're and they, you know, I think they are infiltrating Black Lives Matter. It's very sad because. We need Black Lives Matter. We need to, you know, protect protect ourselves and protect, um, especially, you know, um, communities of color and black men and women. Are getting- and I agree, man. And and we just had the movie come out, Judas and the Black Messiah. And I always talk about how people who become snitches can affect the whole community. But now snitches don't get snitches and music and pretty much get like a huge fan base off of that. So I just want to know your thoughts about that and how we can prevail in 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, um, my war musicians and activists tells of particularly good exposés on uh, how the white community, how there was um, seem to be, Fake musicians like that, snitches in the music industry. Yeah, these were see, yeah these were the sons and daughters of the oligarchs that were all over you know uh, the you know like becoming instant stars in the white white music scene in the nineteen sixties, and I'm sure it was done in the black music scene too, and I'm sure it's being done now in the black music scene. Sadly enough, uh, with um, you know rappers that um, are just elevated for their because they're doing the bidding of the oligarchs. Well, you know, people like Public Enemy were, were you know, not promoted at all. Um, you know, Chuck D said that they promote the most negative uh, artists and they won't promote them and other political artists, you know, positive political artists. Sorry about the phone. Um, and so this has been going on at least since uh, then, since the 19, you know, early 90s when Public Enemy was strong. And um, it's, still, it's surely still going on today where they've got these very bizarre things that seem to be trying to promote drugs like crazy. And I show evidence of that in my book, Drugs, drugs as Weapons Against Us. I think I show it in the, FBI, the last chapters of the FBI World to Buck Score and Black Leaders too, how they uh, just are promoting um, 
uh, you know, all kinds of drugs, uh, ecstasy and other drugs. These rappers, tons of fame and, and just, you know, doing in, you know, or, you know, not promoting or doing in, you know, great activist rappers like Tupac and, um, and, you know, and sadly enough, uh, Jam Master J from, from the DMC and, you know, other just, uh, more positive rappers and activist rappers like Paris and, you know, just not promoting him at all. I mean, people barely know him. They barely know, you know, some of the other great activist rappers. Okay. Well, I want to know who you think that really killed Tupac Shakur because the media always try to make a situation. But after knowing what you said, do you think he was assassinated by the powers yes, to be? I mean, he, he was a national activist leader. He was a inter, international uh, cultural leader. Um, and so, yes, he, he, and it was done. He was assassinated by, um, you know, U.S. intelligence. Mm -hmm. The best evidence out there is that this was a professional job uh done by you know uh marksman um then you know the high level police detective russell Poole, stumbled upon all he knows he says this must have been this had to be a uh, police operation and police intelligence carrying it out for u.s intelligence um because it was just so sophisticated the way they they carried it out and the way they got away from it and the way they covered it up and he just, you know, he said, he, you know, for example, he talked to the Las Vegas police, you know, where it happened. And they said they had a closet full of beggars, told them, you know, to lay off of it. Um, so they, you know, it's it's usually covered up. And, um, you know, Russell Poole it came out with this, you know, despite superiors, uh, he got tons of promotions as a, as a high level uh, murder detective, homicide detective. And nothing with this. They started demoting him, and he had to retire to come out with this information and ruin his career to come out with this information. He comes out with it. Uh, Randall Sullivan, a you know, veteran uh, journalist, writes a book about Labyrinth. Um, Nick Broomfield does a great movie about it, Biggie and Tupac, and you know, features uh, Russell Poole. And I'm, you know, I have a lot of information in my book, of course, and then film. But um, then they bring in someone like Greg Cading to cover it all up. Now, Greg Kading was had retired early because he was a um, disgraced, you know, uh, police detective who kind of was caught lying in court, and um, and then he becomes, you know, they hire him as, the, as the, his work like crazy, and he's just all disinformation. And of course, they highlight him in in major, you know, uh, film, you know, uh, TV films and stuff, and major films in general. And uh, but the the A and E documentary done co-produced by Mopreem Shakur, Tupac's stepbrother, um, highlights uh, the people like, you know, much more important people than me, like Reverend Al Sharpton, who says this, you know, when people say the kind of things Tupac says, uh, the government doesn't, you know, wants to shut them up. And he basically says, yes, the government did in Tupac, um, in so many words. And, um, you know, it just, the best evidence comes from a guy who they, you know, basically let off of, um, the, the guy, uh, Orlando and Keith, Keithy D was basically given massive leniency in court in order to say what they wanted him to say. And so that, that's the best witness of Greg Kading. And so he's just a joke. He's just a complete disinformation agent. They hired him to come out with, he came out and uh, to come out with, um, smear Russell Poole and just try to discredit Russell Poole and counter what Russell Poole would come out with. Yeah, because I know what show you're talking about, the show Unsolved on USA, and I think that really made right. him look pretty pathetic and weak. Like, to me, from all the interviews that I have watched over the years, he seemed like a very alpha stand-up guy. Cool. Correct. Yeah. Right. I agree. And I agree, and they, uh, they tried to smear him, and they tried to pretend like he just had a heart attack so coincidentally when he's coming out with new evidence to a uh you know a police department 
that he had when he killed Tupac. And in that meeting, now, uh, a close associate, a co-writer with um, Russell Jr. was actually in that meeting and surprised um, Russell Poole. And he thinks that Reggie Wright Jr. killed him at, in that meeting um, you know, for U.S. intelligence. Um, that wasn't really a heart attack. Um, and so, because the evidence that Russell Poole had was, you know, partly implicating Reggie Wright Jr. and implicating, you know, others who were more directly involved in the uh, murder of Tupac. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it past him because he always looked guilty every interview he does. And and I have a question. My Well, a friend of mine want to know mm -hmm. is what about Gene Deal? Do you think everything that he had put out holds some truth to it? I, I don't know everything. Yeah, I think he did a great job, Gene Deal, of identifying the real, you know, real murderer of Biggie. Um, you know, he, and he... he put out, uh, you know, some, just some, some good information in general. I don't know everything you put out, but some good information about how, um, you know, Biggie and uh, Puffy were, were businessmen, you know, and, and of course Biggie was a great rapper, and uh, and they, they you know, um, Biggie and uh, identified them. He, you know, he, had, he identified their faces in a lineup, in a photo lineup that, um, Nick Broomfield laid for laid out for him, and you know this this guy um, who really killed him, and those guys were friends. There's in Death Row Records that Russell Poole said when he he just found these dozens of his fellow police officers of all levels of Death Row Records. He asked his superiors, "What are they doing there?" And his superior said, "You can call them covert agents." Okay, so this was so Death Row Records was a U.S. intelligence front for gun running and for setting up Tupac's assassination. You know, first trying to control Tupac and manipulate him to put out more negative lyrics, but then when they when he was Tupac was leaving them and putting out, you know, his last album was more positive with great songs like White Man's World and Against All Odds revealing information. So it's a real shame because Tupac was gonna be putting together you know, had already formed his own record label or already formed his own acting company, his film company, you know, he's going to make his own, own films, um, being offered tons of film roles. Um, he was going to do incredible things, you know, uh, who could do so much, so many incredible things. He, you know, he, he, when he was only 17 years old, he had rewrote Shakespeare in modern language and produced, directed, and starred in a Shakespeare play in high school. Um, he was just amazing. You know, he read hundreds of PhD level books before he was on Man, and I, and I also want to ask you about, you know, the rumors with this body double and also with, um, hmm, trying to remember. Um, we have been seeing a lot of YouTube videos on him be, possibly being an Asian or an operative or I something. Being an Asian. Oh, T Tupac Shakur. Uh, an agent of what? That's that's exactly what that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. But it's had it has been YouTube videos. He was an uh, imposter. Uh, that he was a fraud. Just, I'm um, pretty it's much. Just a joke. I mean, I, I can't just say anything like that. You know, it's just too much. Too yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, I just be trying to really, you know, because he was just so unique and so ahead of his time that people don't believe that he could possibly. Be 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 yeah, a I mean, person. The only thing I can say is is yeah. Did they you know, like, document them? Amnesty International calls calls them the uh, closest thing we have to brainwashing. Now I think we actually have brainwashing, but nonetheless, he, he was manipulated in jail. He was psychologically tortured in jail, and and Death Row Records continued the psychological torture. Mm -hmm. and that's why his uh, All Eyes on Me was has most negative lyrics he ever put out there. But Machiavelli. 10 day theory, which was, you know, got more positive again. I mean, it wasn't, you know, hundred percent positive. It was getting more positive. And then, you know, he was moving away from that psychological torture by death row records. Um, and, you know, they, they would beat up and, and kill people in front of Tupac. Uh, you know, that's the kind of crap they were doing. To him. They were constantly feeding him drugs and alcohol, you know, beating people viciously in front of him. And, um, so that was a continuation of the penal coercion tactics outside of jail. And that's why um, Dre got away from Death Row Records, Snoop got away from Death Row Records, and of course Tupac 
couldn't get away and was killed before he did. But uh, so, you know, did they did they uh, influence him to put out his neg- most negative lyrics? Yes, and, uh, you know, and but they had control over him at that point. And now that he wrote most of his lyrics within the first uh, few you know um, days of getting out of jail, his, his head was messed up. But no, for the most part, no, he was he was not manipulated. He was uh, for most of his great activism. Uh, he did great work and um, was not any kind of agent and uh, was not manipulated. Well, that sums it up, everybody. And I'm going to make sure that I promote your book, John, and and online find more about th- these type of subjects. And I just want to say. Thank you for this interview, man, and and I really, really wish you nothing but the best in your future endeavors, man. Thank you, Will. It's good talking to you.